Grief is a taboo because death is a taboo. Death. It's one of the few things that all human beings have to go through. So why do we rarely talk about it? Grief, it's a full body, full being experience. In Western culture, grief can be treated like a dirty secret, but it's something that's completely natural. I think it's important to speak about grief because it normalizes death. I wanted to find out why grief is a taboo subject, whether a wider understanding of it could help people, and what countries like the UK can learn from different cultures around the world. Everyone that knew Ewan uh, would distinctively remember him for his bright blue eyes and his cheeky laugh. Ellie and Ewan were friends from birth. He was very funny, always making jokes, and anyone that knew him um, loved him. He just had that sort of sense of charm about him. <laughs> Ewan died in May 2020 in the middle of the UK's first COVID-19 lockdown. He was 18 years old. It obviously was such a shock to us all. Um, some of my close friends had never been through death before at all. Um, so this is kind of like their first almost like encounter with it. We became really close, like such a close uh, knit group of friends. Um, and it has kind of all made us realise that life is too short and to not take anything for granted. Ellie and her friends supported each other during lockdown with Zoom calls and, when it was allowed, meeting up in person. Going through this, um, it changes you as a person and it's changed all of us as, a, as people. Um, and I think we've kind of got a bond that is going to stay with us for life. Um, going through that with these people, uh, I literally don't think I'd be here without them because they help me so much. Grief. It's a full body, full being experience that affects us on multiple levels. The first being the mental, the second being the physical, the third being the emotional, and the fourth being the spiritual level. I first became fully aware of grief in 2016 when my dad Andy died. Suddenly, me and my family were thrown into this new world. It's like being in a secret club that no one wants to join. It has its own language, own groups, but no one outside of it ever talks about it. Grief is something that's incredibly challenging to talk about for a lot of people and ends up being taboo because we really get challenged and we get held up by the fact that we want to do the right thing and we want to say the right thing and we want to know exactly how to address someone's grief or how to address the topic of death. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, more and more people have joined that grief club. So I think it's really hard to talk about this because we don't know where to start sometimes, but the thing that I recommend is just starting somewhere and starting with people that you're comfortable with and safe with. But not everyone has a strong support network. Around one in four British adults said they wish their friends would talk more about their loved one who had died, and one in five said they felt lonely after a bereavement. As well as that, more than 50% of people said they were scared of saying the wrong thing to someone who's recently lost a loved one. He was loved by all, especially everybody in the community, not just from myself and my sisters and the rest of our family members. Um, he was one of those people that everyone sort of looked up to. Former rugby league player Wayne initially struggled to talk about his grief. His dad Desmond died in January 2020. Me, me personally, um, I, t I tend to hold old stuff quite in a lot. When my dad passed away, I could, I could sort of feel inside, you know, things bottling up. Um, and, I, and I didn't sort of want that to, to explode inside me to make, to make me feel even worse. Lots of people struggle to open up about their emotions, but men in particular have a hard time. 58% of men feel like they're expected to be emotionally strong and show no weakness, and 38% have even avoided talking about their feelings out of fear of being unmanly. But as Wayne found out, speaking about things can really help. I sort of got my my feelings off my chest by speaking to friends, more so than family. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely important to speak about it because like I say, if you bottle it up too much, it can make things worse. And now I'm, I'm, I'm coping, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with it and it's, it's, it's something that I've got, I've got to live with, so, so yeah.
our grief experience can be shaped by many different parts of our identity, whether that's our race, our gender identity, our place in the world, like our location, our culture, our background, our family, our class, our income. It can be impacted by so many pieces of what make us us for the rest of our lives. Dealing with death is a universal experience, but in the UK, it's often hidden away. But that isn't the case elsewhere in the world. Just south of Mexico City, San Andreas Meeks Kick is famous for Day of the Dead. The ceremony celebrates the souls of dead loved ones returning to the world of the living. And they're welcomed with colorful feasts and huge celebrations. People build shrines for their loved ones and even cook their favorite meals. A visitarnos, y es una alegría para nosotros. Pues no, no, no nos da miedo la muerte, no me da miedo. Pues no me da ni alegría, ni muerto, ni este, ni miedo, porque pues si llega la muerte con nosotros, pues ya. But in 2020, much like a lot of things, the ceremony was very different. It's traditional to visit cemeteries and leave offerings on graves, but because of COVID-19, this had to be scaled back. Some families lost a lot of loved ones to the pandemic, and for them, it was an important year to mark the Day of the Dead. Tengo muchos seres queridos que no están con nosotros, pero aquí estamos y le estamos rindiendo culto a ellos también. Nos sentimos muy tristes. Muy tristes por las pérdidas que tenemos ahorita de toda nuestra familia. Nos da mucha tristeza, pero también nos da, por ejemplo, gusto de que lleguen nuestros seres queridos a visitarnos. But it isn't just Mexico that approaches death and grief so openly. Erica struggled with her grief after finding her father-in-law dead at his house. She became fascinated with so-called death festivals around the world. So much so that she started a visit. The place I went to in Indonesia is um, an area called Tana Taraja, which is very, uh, it's a landlocked remote region of Indonesia. And there, um, every year, they will actually exhume the dead from the crypts and they will give them new clothes and walk them around. And everyone's taking photos. People are FaceTiming, you know, like FaceTiming relatives who couldn't make made it. But I saw this woman, she was sat next to her grandmother who'd been dead for four years. And there was this moment where she just looked at her and saw a bit of dust in her hair, and she just brushed it away. And I had this moment of thinking, I forgot about the love. Like, all of this is based on love. <laughs> the death festival in Nepal is called Gai Jatra, which literally translates to cow festival. So um, the point of Gai Jatra is that everybody who's lost somebody that year will join a procession through the streets of uh, Kathmandu. The biggest lie that grief tells you is that you're alone, this drowning loneliness that accompanies bereavement. And it's actually pretty difficult to feel like you're alone when you're looking out over thousands of people who are dancing through the streets because they've been through the exact same thing as you and they've been through it this year. So in Madagascar, every five to seven years, um, the family will go to the family tomb pull out the bo dead bodies and wrap them in a new shroud. And then they'll put them on their shoulders and dance around. Again, there's a big band, there's loads of music, everyone's getting drunk. And it is utterly joyful. There's a lot of things we can learn from death festivals around the world. Death is ordinary. Um, it's painful, but here we sort of talk about it as if it's an aberration every time, as if something's gone horribly awry. The other thing we should learn is that when someone dies, you have your grief and your loss, but you're also dealing with a death reminder. You're dealing with mortality itself, and that is a stressful thing. You shouldn't leave it until someone's died or you yourself are dying. We should be able to just mention it easily. It shouldn't be rude to mention death. But in Western culture, it is something we struggle to talk about. In fact, around two thirds of people think we do not open up enough about death in the UK. One of the things that we can do 
in general to make it less challenging to address is just getting comfortable with the fact that we're all gonna have to wait our way through it. Some people though, confront it every single day. I work for Marie Curie um, Rapid Response Service. Basically, we're at the end of the telephone for what people need overnight with regards to end of life and, and palliative care. Jill goes to people's houses to help treat them at the end of life. She deals with death on a daily basis and says it's given her a new perspective on it. I know I'm a lot more comfortable around death and dying. Um, it's not so, something you shouldn't speak about. We don't, we don't talk enough about, uh, about death and dying until it sort of smacks you in the face, if you like, you avoid it. Um, but, but we shouldn't. When somebody's in the last, um, that last stage of life and you see them accept the fact that death's imminent and you see that more of a weight lifted, they relax, that would also happen with family and things. It's important. But it isn't just medical professionals who have decided to confront death and grief in their everyday lives. Dan and his twin brother Tom formed the Van Architects back in 2004. Tom died of skin cancer in 2016, aged 28. He was the main songwriter of the group, so Dan took up that position. I was given this vehicle to help process my grief. When you go to write an album, you, you, I suppose you write about whatever is most important to you or whatever is most prominent in your life. And obviously everything was eclipsed by um, Tom's death. And so it was the only thing I could write about, but it was, it was a gift to me. <laughs> The songs Dan wrote about his grief, with titles like Death Is Not Defeat, Mortal After All and Doomsday, connected with fans around the world. Every night we would see hundreds or thousands of people in tears, you know, the whole front row. I could see bawling their eyes out and it was like I had become like some like a death doodler or some kind of grief guru, which, which I wasn't, you know, I was just um, obviously being vulnerable. I was being vulnerable in front of people I didn't know. When my brother was sick, I used to think a lot about this, about being here, specifically behind the stage with my brother, telling him I couldn't believe that we were here. The band openly discussed grief and loss on stage, and their live shows have become emotionally charged events. He was better. I've been in these crowds, and I can tell you, it's a different experience to any other gig you'll go to. Thank you so much. But for Dan, this emotional response from audiences proves why it's so important to talk about grief. It ought to be spoken about um, uh, in, a, in a very real and honest way. I think it's important to speak about grief because it normalises death. Everyone I spoke to agreed that grief and death are taboo subjects because it reminds people of their own mortality. And I get why that's uncomfortable. It isn't something you want to think about all the time but hiding it away isn't healthy. There's no right way to do it, but speaking openly about grief, whether you're on a stage, at a death festival, or even just chatting with friends on a Zoom call can be so important. It's something we're all gonna experience in one way or the other. So we might as well get ready for it. I absolutely do not believe that there is a right way to grieve or a normal way to grieve or a typical way that everyone grieves not something to be scared of or feel awkward about. It's definitely important to speak about it because like I say, if you bottle it up too much, it can make things worse. And the sooner we can embrace that, the sooner we'll be able to live better, happier lives. And certainly in my experience, live lives with more purpose. <laughs>